Welcome. My name is Jubilee, and I am an astrologer. The intention behind this podcast is to explore and honor the threads of meaning and wonder already woven into astrology, to expand my relationship and understanding of the stars by journeying with others as we connect back to our authorship of self, and to gather the threads that we wish to contribute to the collective story that humanity is writing with the stars. This is the Mini Myth Astrology Podcast. Hello, and welcome to the Mini Myth Astrology Podcast. I am Jubilee, and today I have the absolute delight that is having Sarah with me today, which I know you as Sarah Avery Myers. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Because I will have other Sarahs on the podcast, so... I love my maiden name, so yeah. we can use that. Okay. <laughs> we'll go with that one. Um, I love my husband and all, but, <laughs> but I miss my maiden name. It's real good. It's got, yeah. like, poetry Flow. to it. Yeah. <laughs> Sarah is here with us today to launch into Leo season. Sarah is a Leo sun and Mercury as well as her midheaven is in Leo. And we'll unpack all of that a bit over time. <laughs> she is also a Aquarius moon and a Scorpio rising. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I either didn't remember all that or I didn't know it yet. <laughs> it's all news to you. This is one yeah. of my favorite things about doing podcasts with people who I love but don't necessarily love astrology yet because it is your discovery along Mm -hmm. with how the podcast flows outward is you're getting you're figuring it out (laughs) with the audience and with me so i'm going to take a couple of moments to just talk about leo in general and then maybe some of the interpretations of your specific placements how's that sound cool yes (laughs) okay So Leo is a fire sign, and it is fixed fire, meaning that it comes right in the middle of a season. And the associations with fixed energy are similar to the word fixed, is that it really gets to lean in and be the center anchor energy for a sign like it is here to be like fully itself, Hmm. whereas the cardinal starts a season and carries a little bit of its last season and mutable is the blending between seasons fixed Mm. lives right in the middle of those okay yeah and it is interpersonal fire meaning that it Mm. is relational fire so Mm. there are three modes for each of the elements you have personal so aries is personal fire Leo is interpersonal, and then Sagittarius is collective. So it gradually grows in the oh. scope and context in which that element is expressed. And that is part of what gives them their different flavor, even though they're the same element. Mm. Also, their position in the season. So, right, for instance, Aries is cardinal. It starts a season. Leo is fixed. It is the middle, like deeply embodying the energy of that season. Mm. And then Sagittarius is mutable, meaning that it holds both the energy of its season and the season to come and is the bridge between them. Cool. I didn't know Sagittarius was a fire sign. It is. But my knowledge of astronomy, astrology, yep, (laughs) is, is, uh, you know, it's more basic. Yeah. So yeah, that's cool. That's perfect. Because I did take a... astronomy in college (laughs) (laughs) which we'll talk about because there's this really cool 
Well, maybe I'll talk about that to begin with. But there's this interesting parallel between the story of Leo being really bright and connected to the sun and a Mm. sign that really shines. Mm. And its constellation is also very bright. It is one of the most distinct constellations and one of the more easily identified ones. So there's just this like parallel between both the astrology and the astronomy. Nice. Cool. (laughs) Yeah. It's also been known as the lion across cultures since they think about 4,000 BCE. And it was a lion in Babylonian astrology as well as Syrian. And it's really maintained its Mm. association with the lion for a very long time. Wow. Very fixed. (laughs) Very fixed. Yes. See, I love your brain. That connection is like already perfect. Of like, yeah, it has remained steadily. So there's actually its brightest star is Regulus and it has been consistently like known as the heart of Leo but also the, it's known as the king star Aha. so there's this way yes. that Leo's also <laughs> been consistently associated with mm. nobility and leadership mm. across centuries and across cultures mm. cool okay so starting at your basic kind of understanding of what it means to be a Leo sun and how that fits for you or if there's any ways that you're kind of don't vibe with the typical descriptions tell me a little bit about how Leo feels for you (laughs) well so all of my knowledge and understanding of astrology is from my preteen years and reading 17 magazines which my aunt got me a subscription back then. And I I read those all, you know, since I was 11 through high school and everything. And I always read my astrology and I was so into that and like following it. And it's, it is kind of funny because, you know, my husband Brian is like very much not into astrology type stuff. He's a very... He's a Pisces. He's a realist. I don't know how. <laughs> but when I read about Pisces, I'm like, oh, he's a Pisces. <laughs> he's very sensitive and emotional. But yeah. <laughs> so it is interesting. This is something he would say probably is like, well, was your personality like that? Or is it because you read those throughout your formative years that you became like that? And it's like, but when I think about myself as a younger kid, before I was reading those, it's like, oh yeah, I've always been like the outspoken, like I love to make people laugh and I'm loud and like <laughs> I do love fiercely. I I also can get, you know, easily hurt mm. or left out or mm-hmm. just get, you know, just be sensitive in those ways where <laughs> I'm very much a people pleaser. <laughs> And so if I start to feel like I've rubbed somebody the wrong way or we just aren't getting along well, then it it gets to me and I like I want to fix that and I want us I want to be on good terms with everyone. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, definitely leadership position like I've I've always been like I am totally willing to be the first one to talk up about something or you know, take the reins. But yeah, it is it is funny. I I very much associate with much of the Leo <laughs> uh, you know, personality traits and including the more or less negative ones, you know, whereas what you could be prideful. Mm-mm. Uh I can't remember the other ones right now cuz that's usually the main one that gets pointed out, but yeah, I can be prideful. I could sometimes want more of the spotlight than is, you know, maybe appropriate. (laughs) Um, Yeah. I mean, those are the ones that come to mind that I'm aware of in terms of the traits of the Leo. Mm -hmm. What are, what are some other ones I might be missing? Yeah. (laughs) I mean, I love all of those and I find it 
really interesting too for you to reflect across the consistency of those traits and being able to look back at like tiny Sarah and preteen Sarah and like current Sarah and see the enduring quality of a lot of that in your experience of being you. I would describe Leo as living heart first. Mm, Yes. It is ruled by the sun and so there is a way that it carries gravity in its being and a luminous, like a shining forth mm. that I think even the Leos that I know that are shyer, they do carry this gravity and warmth and light in their being. And that can look like a lot of forms of illumination. So... Mm. You speaking to the way that you do feel called to be the first to speak up about something or willing to lead something or even if we go back into performance and Mm -hmm. the role that it's played in your life, Sarah was a ballerina and performed a lot and so there's a way that that willingness to be seen willingness to let your heart be known and lead feels like the essence of leo to me Mm. it is also deeply connected to creativity and a form of being in touch with the inner child that yeah that never that doesn't diminish in the same way that I think some signs mm. lose track of the tiny version of them. But mm. I think Leo somehow has this golden thread. Mm. And I know when you went into therapy, you also went into working with kids. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Just always being, I don't know really wanting to help kids but yeah definitely the being in touch with my own inner child and I don't know how I ended up working with kids in the first place I think I I got an internship with Family Solutions it was called something before Family Solutions but the same organization and it just happened to be that was the one that I landed in Mm -hmm. but it turned out like I didn't necessarily seek it but it turned out to be a good fit. And it's like, oh, yeah, I do love working with kids. But then later in my counseling career, I realized, oh, yeah, when you work with kids, you work with parents. And <laughs> I'm a people pleaser. And I don't have kids. And that's really hard <laughs> to um, <laughs> just be in that position where here I am. I'm trying to be a leader in, you know, in the sense of a counselor is a leader in that hat mm-hmm. <laughs> or with that hat on and yeah just found it really difficult to embody both of those things mm-hmm. but but yeah I, I when you mentioned inner child it's like oh yes I am very much tied and I'm wearing these earrings today and I specifically thought of you because I was like oh these earrings like they kind of go with my outfit maybe but they I bought them just a few weeks ago And since this is a podcast, I will describe them. They are like these little retro flower cutouts. And they're like handmade by somebody local. And there's like a little bright pink one and a bright green one. And it's got like this shiny foil stuff on it. And it was one of those things where I saw them. And it's like, I don't have a lot of extra money. But I was like, oh, they're so cute. And it's a local person. But it really was that like it made my inner little Sarah just go like, oh, so pretty. And like, I look at them and they make me happy. <laughs> and it's just like, you know, so yeah, inner child and always wanting to be connected to that. I mean, it really is also such a gift to the people around you because the reason that Sarah and I know each other is that we interned at the same place during our years in counseling land and neither one of us are there anymore (laughs) but I think that part of what your presence always brought to that space was a lightness 
and a light and a lot more play and levity that made it tolerable to get through those first years where it was so heavy. Like Mm -hmm. it's so heavy to consciously choose to do this work. And we also did it in a like low income center. And so it was not filtered by any particular experience that somebody was having. It was open to most everybody. So you really never knew who you were going to work with or what experience you would be stepping into with them and where they'd be at in life. And Mm -hmm. so Sarah would... We would trade back and forth in our cubbies, little yes. post-it notes that were just like... <laughs> oh, I still have them. <laughs> I do too. In, in my like mementos box from that time. But it was like... <laughs> you are magic. <laughs> you are magic. And yes, you look compassionate in that sweater. <laughs> does this does this cardigan make you want to talk to me? <laughs> <laughs> And the counseling sweaters. And the counseling sweater. And when I think you really need people that help anchor you in the joy of what you're doing when the work that you're doing is really heavy. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of joy in the work in moments. And the intention is to create a, a container mm-hmm. that holds what's heavy and what hurts most of the time. Mm-hmm unless you're doing a very particular type of therapy, like that's, yeah, that's generally why people seek you and find you. And so Mm -hmm. having you there to play Mm. and to bring delight and light to it was so helpful. And I also find it very interesting because both of us have our midheaven in Leo, which is what I promised to explain. So in the chart, your IC is like where your roots would be. If you were standing in a chart, your IC is what you root into, but your Mm -hmm. midheaven is what you're growing up into and towards. okay. And so for two people whose midheavens are in Leo, which is being radically yourself and Mm. pursuing your passions and being creative and being seen and know Choosing therapy is a really interesting choice because (laughs) you're not doing most of those things, if any of them most of the time, because you're pretty invisible and Mm -hmm. you're often not fully a person in that room and space. And both of us graduated out of it at some point. And I think part of that is the gravity and especially in Mm -hmm. my life, like the nudge of, oh, but you are actually meant to share your voice and be seen Mm -hmm. and have your own personality and preferences and opinions. And in counseling, it's called your bias. And you're always meant to check your bias, which Mm -hmm. your bias is pretty much all of your experience and identity. Mm -hmm. So you're constantly checking all of your Leo, right? You're always like, yeah, oh, I need to be blank canvas Mm -hmm. just yeah is this my stuff or their stuff Mm -hmm. keep my stuff out Mm -hmm. or acknowledge it and put it on the shelf (laughs) Mm -hmm. and i've found since being out of that space that i don't even fully understand what a lifetime of growing in to having my heart that visible will mean for me I imagine it will mean more poetry. It'll mean probably more performing. But in general, I think it might just mean feeling like I can respond from my heart about what's going on in the world or what is happening around me or just channel my creativity without always worrying about my role in that space first because that Mm -hmm. came first in everything in how I moved through community and yeah. how I participated. Yeah. Space for yourself now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And I, I struggled with just spreading myself too thin across too many 
population types, not just kids, but also couples and eating disorders, which I, I always wanted to work with eating disorders because I had my own with bulimia and therapy helped me with that. And so I wanted to, you know, I wanted to help others with that. But then like individuals and families and like no, sp- and, and, you know, obviously I am, you know, I am a Leo how do you say it in my, my main sign is Leo? Yeah, you're Leo's son. <laughs> my Le- son, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so my <laughs> for me to be in that space, I think, you know, part of it actually, it's like that, they call it what, it's the imposter syndrome, right? Where you think like, oh, I'm not doing this good. How Like, how do I know anything? And I, I certainly felt that through a lot of my of my years after graduating, which was only what, two, maybe three years. Cause I didn't get my licensure, but I think part of it too, having my background in performance in ballet, which is acting. I think I also stepped into counseling as a role. Like I am performing mm. in this role. And I think that's, that was kind of like a safe bubble for me to like, I'm not pretending to be a counselor, But for me as a performer, which like I do miss ballet and performing so much, it's just like my body's not in that place anymore and it's just been too many years to do that. But in any case, like just remembering the feeling of being on stage and it's something else to be it's like you're communicating with the audience like you're it's it's indescribable (laughs) it sounds cheesy but like counseling or at least being a counselor in a sense it's like you know I was in when I had my counselor hat on it was I really was trying to perform that role very well but then it's like I'm not being my true self it's like when I'm performing you know in Nutcracker, because that was like our main performance that we would do. But it's like when I am the Arabian mistress, sultress, whatever that's called. But like when I am her, I am her like temporarily and it's so fun. And then I leave it and we're Mm -hmm. done. Whereas like, I think that approach of trying to perform as a counselor, at least for me, it's like, I always felt like you were you were so deeply connected and like that's the difference of our fire signs or our sun signs sorry (laughs) that like I don't know I I think there's we had different experiences but that you know we both had so much heart in it Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. yeah (laughs) I don't know if I had we had had a conversation about the performing aspect of it and I think for me, it is a sincere part of myself, and it asks me to be such a small portion of myself, Mm. and it is the part of myself that was born out of losing my brother so young, and becoming in some ways an emotional tender in my family. And that's something I'm continuously unpacking with. I have my Chiron in Cancer, which is your Chiron's your wounded healer. And Mm. Cancer is connected to your family and the instinct to nourish and protect. and, Mm. And so it is a true part of me to be a very good listener. And it is a true part of me to be a container creator and holder. Like I'm a potter. I am still creating like ceremonial space like I have the urge to create and hold faithfully the conditions in which people can grow and I chose a box instead of a vessel Mm -hmm. because to me counseling always felt like a box and you were literally in a box room and (laughs) in a box chair and you sat so still and we're so much less like you got to be one wedge of your chart maybe a couple because there are a couple of parts of my chart that it makes a lot of sense Mm -hmm. and it also 
makes me think of big cats. Have you ever seen big cats with boxes? No. Okay. They love <laughs> boxes the way little cats love boxes. Oh, okay. Like an actual lion or a cheetah and like those big cats. Okay. Big cats. Love boxes the way that little cats love boxes. Oh. But because they're so big, they just end up squishing the box and still sitting on top of it. Aww. Like they're so proud of themselves. <laughs> <laughs> and I kind of feel that way about boxes in general. It's like, <laughs> cool, I can sit on top of the box, but the box cannot contain me. <laughs> and so... Yes. Getting to leave that space after many treasured years, like it gave me so much and I'm so grateful for it. And it did allow me to express a lot of the facets of my being. But one of the reasons that I loved astrology when I found it was that it's circles and it's circles Um. that keep cycling and keep shifting and the conversation keeps moving And as much as like horoscopes can sometimes make it seem very two dimensional of like, oh, all Leos Mm -hmm. are the same and share the same wretched experiences of their energy. Yeah. (laughs) Is that you're a Leo whose sun is near the top of your chart. You're a Leo who is very visibly Leo. (laughs) And it's in your like 10th house of purpose and career. It's like up at the top of your chart in Mm. the public, very visible part of your chart. Your Mercury is really close to your midheaven in Leo as well, which Mm. is your Mercury is how you communicate and how you relay information and is a big sign of a performer as well that your mode of communicating is in this creative performing passionate energy oh wait so my mercury is in leo also Mm -hmm. oh okay (laughs) yeah (laughs) i think you can hear it um and so like your leo is a very visible leo i have met leos that they're leos in a much more in like personal house in the bottom of their chart in a quieter domain Mm -hmm. and it can be harder for them to access it almost like they put put the sun in a closet somewhere and yes it's like really shiny yeah or they tuck it away at home and they keep it there and keep it close my light isn't safe to shine yeah like or i'm embarrassed or yeah Yeah. Hmm. or it might be that they're only meant to shine that light in a very specific domain but really your leo's like at the top of the chart like i will be perceived i am at the height of the sky watch me roar (laughs) yep (laughs) that checks well i wanted to look at the etymology too of performer with you yeah oh and i i wanted to say i'm so glad that when we're talking about our counseling years and you described it as you know, or you described those years being very sincere. And like, as I'm describing it as like, yeah, I feel like I was performing. Like, as I'm talking, I'm also thinking about what I'm saying. And it's like, performing sounds like somehow, like a performance, like it's not real, or it's not genuine. And it's like, it's very, it's like, that's right. I was very sincere. It's like my love for people and my empathy and my desire to help them with whatever's going on in their lives and help them feel better was genuine. Mm-hmm. But it it is a really heavy job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. how beautiful to come out of it with appreciating it, but also learning about ourselves more in that, okay, what a lovely field. And kudos to everyone still doing it you're yes. amazing yeah we have found that our lives are better in other directions <laughs> yes yeah it, it it does contain in a lot of ways which is very helpful for certain parts of healing and growing and for certain people it's the perfect fit 
professionally and for their lives. Mm -hmm. And it was really hard to acknowledge that it was not, right? Because we'd gone to college for it and we'd interned for it. And (laughs) I went through and got my license and I spent 10 years doing it before I was like, ooh, the amount of times I still walk out of session being like, you talked too much. Even 10 years later of like, oh, you were in the space too much. You talked too much. And it's maybe true for the most profound possibility of healing in therapy for the space to be totally open. I've definitely had people contend with that idea and are like, no, like we love when our therapist is a person. But when I was taught, I was taught like the Mm. way to be a therapeutic presence was to be mostly a non-presence. Yeah. And I just have too much presence. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm so glad that you're still, you're still in a healing space with mm-hmm. astrology and all of these things, because whenever we would talk about things, I love how your mind works, how you frame things, your perspectives, how you can tie things together, like in the psychology counseling world, which is just the world and humans in general. (laughs) So it's applicable everywhere. But I was just always taken back by like just how deep you could go with something or just how different of a perspective. And I, yeah, I always really admired that about you and so wonderful that you can keep using that in this realm also (laughs) thank you and hopefully it gets to ripple out farther i think there was a safety factor for me of not wanting to be seen that i was like i will only do one-on-one with people and part of that probably was similarly coming from this desire to please other people is that I'm really good at attuning to one person. Mm. It still shows up even in this podcast. Like Jim will notice that if somebody is much quieter, I will shift my tone. And how I talk to you is going to be different than how I talked to the people in cancer season Mm. because I shift volume still to this day to meet people where they're at. Yeah. I have gotten much better at knowing when I've moved out of authenticity and am in pure attunement because I can feel that it's comfort in my own body at trying to match or meet certain people Mm. and I've learned to just not have proximity to those people if I can't maintain authenticity in a space or a relationship then I know I probably can't have proximity Mm. to that space or relationship long term So this way, I'm not one-on-one. I can't attune to everybody who will listen to this podcast. I can't choose my words specifically because I know they're the ones that will reach that particular person or make sense or be meaningful for that particular person. It just ripples out. And I don't have influence over it once it's set free, which was the whole intention of this podcast was to unbox the way that people have told me, like, you could write a book, you could share these ideas. And I was like, no, I will happily stay one-on-one with people in a <laughs> tiny room forever. Yeah. And not truly. Yeah. <laughs> but I think I hid there mm. and did a lot of my own healing and learning to be ready to Leo shine, mid-heaven, visible. Yay! And perform, which I'm really intrigued to, like, share some of that with you and get your thoughts. How's Mm. that sound? Yes. Any thoughts before I transition to that? No, not at all. Okay. So, perform means to completely provide, to carry out, to carry into effect, to come true. But my favorite meaning was to live along. So I was thinking about this and another Leo word, which is courage. So the word courage moved through Latin and French and contained this idea of heart, but also temperament. There was a point in time where 
it was literally like you had a version of courage that was brave or you had a version of it that was sad or it was something to do with like something intrinsic Mm. to you and one of my favorite writings about the word courage is by David White and he describes it as courage is actually making visible all the things that you already care about and love deeply and living into the unending vulnerability of those things. Mm. So I think there's a way that Leos, Mm. people who lead or go forward or guide in that way and perform, that we live through them. They go and they take on the role. They live the grief. They spend the hours of dancing so that we can collectively experience what it feels like Mm. to be grace incarnate to Mm -hmm. look like a human in flight to tell Mm -hmm. the emotional story Mm. and that was true in the role that theater played in antiquity which is often that it was storytelling that was teaching a moral so Mm. i've heard it described as tragedy is the character doesn't live long enough to learn their lesson so the audience can Mm. whereas comedy is the character living long enough to learn their lesson Mm. and in that way the audience does too Mm -hmm. so there's this way of performing which is i think people stepping into the role so that everybody else can live alongside without having to go and risk themselves mm. to have that experience mm-hmm. in the process. Yeah, if they don't have the courage. I love that. What was that? That heart, that like the root of courage is heart. Mm-hmm. Ooh. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Leading with your heart. Yeah. And Leo rules the heart mm-hmm. in astrology. It also rules the spine. So oh. the way that like Leo moves with dignity well that works with ballet too with the spine (laughs) yeah so i'm curious as somebody who did perform getting to move whole crowds of people getting to like live (laughs) along with your experience Mm. and your expression how does that fit for you i mean it describes it really well to live with gosh yeah and and certainly the courage to perform Mm -hmm. you know you definitely when you're first starting you get the butterflies right before going on stage and really like well maybe not in like the latter years of when I was performing I didn't really get butterflies anymore but there's also a, a, such a deep vulnerability, like, especially if you're out there by yourself, but even when you're with other dancers, it's just like all eyes on you. And, but when you connect with, and, and dance in particular, right? Because you're not speaking, you know, you don't have words to remember. It's you're remembering choreography. And so you've got that connection in your body and maybe in, in some way that, that does help to have the courage to perform is because you're so connected with your body. You kind of also don't even notice the audience because you're just, you're just trying to line up to your mark correctly and face the right direction. But the moment that you do acknowledge the audience and feel that connection and like when you have a moment of like seeing somebody's you see their expression watching you and it's it's hard to describe that feeling of it was pain because toshus suck (laughs) (laughs) but also really deep joy in just in that particular movement i do i do love ballet i wasn't fond of the body images that were you know put upon us Mm -hmm. to fit into but yeah I think that it is really beautiful 
to just blend this psychology moment and performance moment because there are a collection of neurons in your frontal lobe called mirror neurons and they're actually motor neurons and when you watch somebody do something they fire as though you're doing that thing Uh uh-huh that's right and so when you are tuning in to people watching you dance Mm -hmm. it is because they're getting to experience it alongside you Mm. their bodies even though they're like sitting in those seats Mm -hmm. are also getting to like fly across the stage and twirl in the nutcracker oh (laughs) lovely yeah that's right so the willingness to do that is pretty remarkable the vulnerability to do Mm. that Mm. the heart that that takes to do that Mm -hmm. yeah and I think I see it most expressed now in your willingness to speak about things in the world and the environment that also bring up a lot of passion for you and you're willing to risk that and Mm -hmm. go first and have the courage often to regardless of how you will be perceived because it's not the same space that you know you'll get applauded Uh, yeah like (laughs) when you go and dance in front of a bunch of people who paid to go to ballet the risk of like being rejected or turned against is imagine lower than when you speak from your heart about things going on in the world Mm -hmm. That's a really good way to put it. It's like, it's not as safe of a space as being on stage. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. In my early, early mid twenties, when I started to learn about, you know, the environmental impacts of pollution and just waste and a lot of human practices in general, you know, the food industry and you know, the types of transportation we have, just every, all of the ways in which human behavior is harming the planet. It's like, once I started to learn about those things, I could not turn off the switch of like, ignoring that. And I've just kind of gone down this path, you know, for the last 10 years now. How old am I? Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Almost 20 years. (laughs) Um, That, the more I learn about ways that we can do better for the environment, I am just doing everything that I can to make those changes. You know, that whole jingle of reduce, reuse, recycle. I tell people (laughs) that it's in that order for a reason. (laughs) So it's like, I really try to reduce my consumption of material things or, I'll reuse something. I when I purchase things, I'm I'm choosing something that's not in plastic and also realizing that that's expensive a lot of the time. Not all of the time. I think there's a perception that people have about choosing environmentally conscious behaviors and you know, items that it's just always going to be expensive and people kind of brush it off like, oh, I can't do that. It's so expensive. Mm -hmm. I can't eat organically. That's so expensive, Mm -hmm. which I think that's been debunked for a while now. Like, well, actually organic food is not, especially nowadays, it's not that much more expensive in some cases, but living an environmentally conscious way, it is harder. I actually had a, little bit of a heated discussion about this uh, with one of Brian's friends a couple weeks ago where I can't remember exactly which, like what item we were talking about. If it was like bringing your own bags to the grocery store or choosing, you know, to use, you know, have your hydro flask or whatever reusable water bottle instead of having a bunch of plastic water bottles. And he was talking about the convenience of things and it's like, well, people are just always going to choose convenience. And I'm like, but that's the point is that people have to not choose convenience anymore. And it's about your values, 
if you care enough about the planet and about the little humans that are growing up on this planet and are being left with, you know, a not great environmental uh, situation, then it's easier to make those choices, even if they're not as convenient. You change your your habits, you change your behaviors. And I am, (laughs) I very much get on my soapbox Mm. and (laughs) my husband will... He'll he'll give me little cues now and then to be like, okay, you need to like take it down a notch. Like maybe this isn't the place to go like full eco conscious. <laughs> but but in general, and I've, I've kind of like I've learned how to reel it back and maybe be more subtle. Like I'm at the grocery store, you know, just checkout line, and the you know the cashier will ask me if I want a plastic bag i mean they don't say plastic bag but it's like i'm getting two items that i can very easily carry in my arms by myself (laughs) and they're like oh do you want a bag and it's clearly a plastic bag and i say no thank you gotta reduce our use of plastic (laughs) or i say something like that like we gotta reduce our plastic use (laughs) like i try to make it this cute little thing instead of like a guilt trip you like no, I don't use plastic bags. Like I'm not, I don't need a plastic bag for this. <laughs> like I've, I've learned <laughs> it's like I could be very intensely Leo, Leo about it where I just like oh, I get kind of I get angry. I get I do. I get very upset when people don't think about it. Like, oh my gosh, I go to Costco for certain things. And there are eggs at Costco, right? Mega packs of eggs. There's the uh, Wilcox or something brand that's like, they're in Oregon, I think. And they have a mega pack, like, you know, 22 dozen pack of eggs in like a normal paper carton, right? That's great. And then all the other brands of eggs, which are probably not from Happy Chickens, are in clamshell plastic containers. And it drives me nuts when I go in there because normally I'll get my eggs from the local people down the street. That's the most eco-friendly thing is like just in your neighborhood if you can. And I'll stand there and I'll watch people just like go for the plastic one. And the price is like not even a dollar difference. It's like it's very affordable so it's like i've learned how to be a more gentler leo that can like be more encouraging and like i'm like hey reduce your user cycle <laughs> like, let's let's be encouraging about this um and not bite someone's head off <laughs> because i don't understand how they could not think about these things and uh yeah so Getting, I, I get up on my soapbox a lot about <laughs> how people can choose better. And I'm not perfect. You know, there are ways in which we don't choose the most uh, environmentally friendly choice on our end. But there's a documentary called Seaspiracy about the industrial commercial fishing industry. And when Brian and I, my husband Brian and I saw that back in... Yeah, I think it was 2021 because it was like one of our, you know, things we did during the pandemic, you know, watching all these movies. We watched that and we used to love going out for sushi, like almost every weekend kind of thing. And for the past three years going on four, we have not eaten sushi. We don't eat commercially caught fish. Like that was a very eye opening uh, documentary and it's that that the commercial fishing industries have such an insane impact on the environment by way of the oceans and like destroying it and killing so many you know marine life and yeah so <laughs> anyway yeah huh? how long did I just talk about <laughs> the planet and like trying to be nice to people about please <laughs> Well, also I'm being really, good on the planet. <laughs> I'm really curious how it feels to be you right now. Ooh. Like, as you're like, how does your heart feel? How does it feel to get fiery? Like, oh, yeah. You know, 
especially on that topic, like, even though ballet has its harmful impact on my life in the past, it was also just like a warm, fuzzy feeling as we're talking about the past of both ballet and counseling and like getting into the environmentalist stuff. It's like, I'm passionate about it. But yeah, it is a much more fiery, like, I get I get upset about the state of the world and it puts me a lot more into my head mm. than not so much in my body. Mm. Yeah. I might have booped you into your uh, Aquarius <gasps> What is that moon. one? What is, ooh. Well, your Aquarius is like, it is air, it's collective air, and it's your moon, which is your internal and emotional self and the way that you Mm. engage in the unconscious and the realm of feelings Mm. and Aquarius is this need to both be fully your authentic self while also holding the awareness of all other beings and your impact and it's about innovation and it's about the need to keep progressing with the well-being of all involved at the heart of it. Oh. So the fact that you can name, like, And Oop. that's my emotions that's and my yeah. subconscious. Yeah. Oh, no wonder, like, people pleaser counselor Sarah had a hard time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You have some Libra that I think might also account for some of the people pleasing. But I don't know that we have time to go. Maybe we yeah. talk no. again. But I think the really interesting thing that you're describing there too is like here's this thing that was once a fire for me and has now just kind of gone down to embers of the memory and here's another thing that used to be the fire of my life and now it's embers down to a memory versus here's the thing that I am willing to risk it for that I can't (laughs) not get in my soapbox and the word passion actually means to suffer Oh, so yeah. there's a way that passion in the traditional sense and its etymological roots meant like this willingness or maybe even the inability to not block out suffering. Like compassion means to suffer together. Mm. And so I think the way that you're saying, right, of like once I know, I can't unknow. Mm. Once I felt, I can't unfeel. My heart is now just opened to this. Mm -hmm. My heart is impacted and I can't go back. I think is a part of Leo's like living heart forward. And especially for you and how it shows up at the top of the chart. Like Mm. I need to live towards this and live in alignment with this. Like when something breaks my heart, Mm -hmm. I listen. Mm Mm-hmm. When something lights up my heart, I listen. Mm. How's that feel? I I just want to stay in this space because <laughs> then I start thinking about like our work of farming mm-hmm. that Brian is the farmer and I do all the office stuff and it's nice to get out of work mode because I'm we work and live from home and I'm just constantly all about whether it's housework, which is still work, (laughs) or the work work, I'm just constantly stuck there. Mm -hmm. And we're both struggling with that. Like we're just constantly working and we're not, the brief moments we have for ourselves. it's like, they're brief. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And so doing something like this where it's like, we, I can just. I'm hanging out with you, my friend, but we're also able to like go into, you know, oh my gosh, the other parts of life in Mm -hmm. my life. Mm -hmm. And oh yeah, I love my creativity and (laughs) I want to, and it's really, it's really nice to hear about the, um, I keep forgetting the name of it. Midheaven. (laughs) Midheaven. (laughs) And of course, I keep thinking crown because you do that motion of midheaven above your head. And I'm like, crown, right? Yeah. I mean. My crown is Leo. Your regal. (laughs) (laughs) It's 
<laughs> regal Leo crown. Yeah. It's perfect. I think of it like a <laughs> the crown of your tree, too. So. Oh, yeah. Like, but that's. Yeah. It's, it's really nice to hear about these aspects, like, as, like, I'm going to be 38 in a few weeks and I'm getting older. This is, like, the next chapter of age, right? And, um to reflect on you know the midheaven midheaven i mean it's gonna like be crown perfect. it's crown whoever listened to this that like <laughs> has never heard of the midheaven before mid-heaven. they're crown. gonna like be like i so got midheaven now <laughs> yeah the top of your chart <laughs> but i don't the i crown still think you're crown. wearing yeah <laughs> but just knowing that my my midheaven is in leo or mm-hmm. my, yeah. yeah and the, and my moon is Aquarius. Mm-hmm. Okay. And what was the rooting one again? That's your I see. I see. I think it would be an Aquarius because they're actually opposite signs. So you're always oh. holding the polarity between the like Leo's need to be like fully itself, fully in its experience, mm-hmm. pursuing what makes it feel alive. And the Aquarius that is also really needs to be in its authenticity, but is never not aware of the impact of its actions and <laughs> the need for everybody else around you to also get mm. to be in their authenticity and mm. to build a world where everybody is safe mm. to have that experience and so that like responsibility part of Aquarius being in your moon mm. could be a piece of what you're describing as people pleasing is just trying to figure out the puzzle because I think Aquarius's puzzle is maybe one of the most challenging which is how do I be fully myself and leave room and make room for everybody else mm-hmm. to be fully themselves yeah I love that oh yeah these are great reminders because and that's where I was going with it is like knowing that I'm very much a Leo Mm -hmm. (laughs) and as I've gotten older I do see where like me as a Leo I can be a selfish person I can be not thoughtful of others I could be thinking too much of myself and like just live my life that way and you know these past 10 years I feel like I've very much tried to focus on focus on others <laughs> but like just knowing that i have that energy and I, I and love for people and like and all of that but also being more and more conscientious of what are people's needs in this moment or in general and just living more consistently that way and i feel like that's been very very helpful so I do want to lean into the Aquarius of authenticity and, you know, while being aligned with the Leo. Yeah. I mean, you kind of had to learn how to be in relationship to other people being an only child. Because you did spend so much time oh, yeah, in your own that. world and imagination. And like, man, yeah. I could just talk to you endlessly. And I'm pretty <laughs> sure that my sweet and wonderful editor would be very sad if we keep going. <laughs> So if we need to transition, what, if anything, do you feel like needs saying or I'm really just want to express how grateful I am for you showing up in your fullness. And also it's so delightful to get to mirror to you more pieces of your chart and more pieces of your wholeness that, you know, unlike your husband's concern that you only were those things because you read the horoscope and it (laughs) informed you is you didn't read this part of your astrology and you can still find yourself in it and go oh i'm this and this and that's what the chart does the whole way around because you actually have every single sign and every single house everybody does you are a Mm. full chart whether you have a prominent placement there or not you experience all of the same energies. Mm-hmm. You are whole. You are complicated. <laughs> and it's been lovely to get to mirror that to you and maybe help you see some of those pieces and how they've evolved over time. It is. And I am almost always going to get teary-eyed with you <laughs> whenever we come together. Because you... Um, and yeah, especially... 
uh, going into the astrology and of course the way that, that you frame it and connect everything is it's, it's really nice to feel more connected with myself and with you and the world. Mm. So thank you. Goal accomplished. <laughs> I love you so much. I love you. Thank you for being here. I suspect that you don't necessarily want to be found on the internet, but if there is anywhere, feel free to let people know. Oh, yeah. Well, the only place I could say is uh, our farm, our lovely organic regenerative <laughs> sun-grown cannabis farm so uh <laughs> adult only situation there technically <laughs> but we are green bandit and our uh website is gogreenbandit.com very cool. but that's very much in line with our environmental values in being regenerative and sun-grown and all the good things for the planet and for the people <laughs> and you can find me at mini myth astrology on instagram and you can book on my website at mini myth astrology.com and as always i am so grateful you gathered around this fire this particular leo campfire warm <laughs> <laughs> fire has been such a gift and each of you are such a gift so thank you for listening and let's talk again soon we are a love affair of earth and sky you and i we share the planets the stars the tides we learned her faces and phases from the places we grew and together Weave meaning from these differing views to know her anew. Thank you for gathering round this fire with us to hold this ancient love renewed. A story made more complete because of you. <laughs>